So can you open the presentation? Because uh, it would be easier for everyone to follow what I want to share with all of you uh, this morning. So uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, uh, morning keynote. Thanks uh, to organizer, ITM Network, as well as ECOC uh, uh, Rijeka, who invited me to be part of this uh, uh, ITM gathering. This uh, uh, morning uh, keynote uh, will focus on democratic cultural policy. So uh, basically I will discuss uh, the concerns the limitation, the paradoxes, the consequences, as well as responsibility of democratic forms within the cultural policy framework. Um, what is basically very complex uh, issue, especially if we take into account that the culture as a word uh, is one of two or three more complicated word in English language, uh, what stress uh, uh, Raymond Williams, Williams already at the end of the 70s. On the other side, we have democracy, uh, proliferation of uh, uh, democratic forms uh, which happen all around. And uh, uh, at the end of the 90s, uh, uh, detected in a literature 550 types of democracy. So this explosion of labeling of democratic forms show us that the democracy as a political system can be um, appear in a variety of democratic practices and uh, give us opportunity to analyze, to explore what it exists and what are missing there. So, I'm not an artist, and I'm glad that uh, uh, you come to this uh, uh, keynote, especially because this uh, uh, morning uh, or this whole day will, as I heard, will detect it somehow to the issue of advocacy. So, I will basically talk about the uh, cultural policy in a relation to, uh, uh, to democracy. Uh, I will use this mic. Does it work? No? Now it works. Okay, I will move here. Um, I will need the help of some of uh, your colleagues from ITM Network with my presentation. So I will move a little bit uh, around. Um, to pass with all of you through, uh, through this lecture. So please, uh, uh, next slide. Uh, what is important uh, when we talk about the cultural policy, to understand what the cultural policy is. So it uh, uh, exists when the agents of the political system intervene in the production, distribution, consumption of the cultural products, cultural services, cultural experiences. And the cultural policy basically express the relations between the political system on one side to the cultural resources. And this kind of the relationship can be uh, normative, ideological, organizational, economical, or any kind. But uh, what is really important when we talk about the relations between the cultural policy and democracy is uh, to understand four different dimensions. One of them is, of course, access and the participation uh, and I will basically focus uh, uh, most of this uh, keynote on this area because the topic of this uh, gathering is an uh, audience. But uh, um, other dimensions are also important when we want to explore cultural policy from the dim dimension of democratic forms. So uh, to explore the scale of democracy within the cultural policy framework. One of them, of this dimension, is expression of democratic aims, ideas, principles, norms, and so on, which basically appear in different uh, documents, uh, in different uh, uh, political decisions. So we can basically explore uh, the scale of democracy in those documents. Another dimension is related to in this institutional structure, to agents and their interests. So basically how 
the institutions are structured and uh, uh, which kind of the procedure they develop, is it a democratic or not, or in which uh, uh, level, which scale. Um, a third dimension is, as I said, already access and the participation. And one of the crucial questions here is for whom do governments support arts and culture? And the main assumption here is that everybody has the right to uh, uh, access to culture as a social good. And the fourth dimension is distribution of economic resources, uh, which uh, uh, based on the I that ideas and the strategies are implemented through money, and the money is one of the possible indicators in many cases, uh, uh, the, the most concrete indicator of the public and the private uh, investment. And here, uh, one of the, of the question is which mechanism for distribution is the most democratic? So we, we can analyze the mechanism of the distribution if we want to see how, democrat how democratic is or not. Please, next slide. But, uh, um, so can you... Uh, and, uh, yes, please, to put everything, because otherwise it wouldn't function, to ask you, please, next, next. Okay, thank you. Uh, um, so, talking, uh, as I said, I will focus uh, uh, a little bit on uh, access and the participation. Talking about the participation, we can all of us know that uh, it has a long tradi tradition. It appears in various uh, different geopolitical contexts. And it's also results of the changes between the, uh, in relation between the state and the citizens. And it's a results of the communication and the technology development. Uh, participation basically today is uh, not a static uh, static numeric uh, uh, concept at all. So uh, we experience uh, this uh, shift to participation and live in that uh, area. So it means uh, that uh, participation um, exists today in different areas. It's uh, not only in the political arena, then also in education, in the media, as well in arts and culture. So. Um, Today, participation it became democratic imperative and somehow poison uh, new opium for the people, poison for the people. So something happened here with my presentation. Um, so I need the next slide, but if it's not possible... Okay, we, we lose the time, so I will... I will stay here. Okay, so the ne this is the next slide, and please, it's not possible. Okay, so uh, I will uh, uh, continue without my presentation. I will uh, bring my laptop here so to, to help me. So maybe I can use now this mic. Sorry. It's a technical problem. So I move to this mic, and you can hear you? Great. Okay, so um, talking about the participation today, it's uh, necessary to be aware of the fact of the differences between the instrumentalization of the participation and the real participatory institutions. Uh, distressed by many authors. Uh, so it means that uh, each participation doesn't mean that it is emancipatory. Uh, for uh, political interests, for politicians, is uh, much more easier to justify uh, public spending on uh, uh, cultural projects uh, if uh, the project gather a larger number of people. Um, in many cases, uh, uh, participation is not fulfilled. It's just used as a starting point, as an inspirational uh, moment, but uh, basically it's not devoted enough time, enough resources, enough attention to something what is so complex and demanding as a, a citizen's engagement is. Then also, in a majority of cases, uh, the engagement of citizens uh, doesn't make a real distribution of power and resources. So it means that the decision-making process 
is not open at all, and that we face this um, uh, some kinds of disbalance between scale of democracy and the scale of uh, decision making. Uh, Participatory instruments uh, today dominantly focus on uh, creation of the public, formulation of the public opinion, uh, and are far less attentive to actual reform. So this is what basically we have. But talking about the cultural participation as a right, two main documents uh, uh, we have uh, as a at least as an inspirational documents. One is a, a Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and another one is the Universal Declaration on the Cultural Diversity. Uh, but to understand cultural participation today is uh, uh, also necessarily to see the difference between traditional understanding of the cultural participation and the contemporary approach or understanding interpretation of the cultural uh, participation. So. The traditional one understand participation as a very passive, uh, as attendance uh, at the cultural events and the consumption of cultural contents, which is basically listening to concerts, reading books, uh, watching movies, visiting museums, and so on. On the other side, the contemporary understanding of the cultural participation uh, understand participation as an active as a playing music, writing books, creating movies, curating exhibitions, and so on and so on. And basically, this uh, uh, contemporary understanding of participation tackled the all elements of the cultural circle, from the creation, through production, distribution, till facilitation. But the higher level of the cultural participation represents a participatory approach, which means participation in decision-making bodies and the process. Why it's important to explain this? Because the participation still understand in a different way, depends on the context. So in many cases, and I, I, I met several people, uh, researchers around Europe, uh, who told me that the participation for them is a still very passive, uh, uh, passive action, and this is the reason why they uh, uh, decided to use some other terms, other notions such as engagement or inclusion when they want to express this necessity of the citizens' engagement in arts and culture. So um, we basically when we, uh, you, you can move to another slide, another, so, okay. So it's, it's through this uh, changing of understanding of participation, we basically face this shift from passive observer to, be, to being uh, active uh, creators. Um, looking, next slide, looking uh, at, uh, um, at the cultural policy and the paradigm which uh, tackled the issue or which established because uh, of access and the participation with the aim of inclusion and, uh, and the participation. Uh, in the history development of the cultural policy, we can find two main paradigms. One is a cultural democratization, and another one is a cultural democracy. The first, cultural democratization, which uh, uh, appeared to provide access uh, to cultural goods uh, to the general public, appear around 60s as a top-down approach, monocultural concept, and uh, with the elitist approach, uh, which established in the 19th century. And as a critique uh, to this uh, uh, concept, to this paradigm of the cultural policy, uh, during the 70s, the cultural democracy appear uh, as a bottom-up pluralistic concept which promote a cultural diversity, cultural rights, multiculturalism, and community cultural values. So while cultural democratization focus on a high culture, cultural democracy focus on a popular culture. And basically the cultural democracy is the paradigm which uh, recognize the creativity of each social group and also created the support for the creativity of each social group. So in that sense, it's a create a equal opportunities for citizens to be culturally active on their own terms. Um, in a difference, 
cultural democratization as the first paradigm which uh, uh, appeared to provide the success uh, to cultural goods, uh, recognized the role of experts as a very important role. And the experts are the ones who decide and determine what are aesthetically superior forms of arts. The Cultural democratization paradigm uh, uh, created the measures uh, such as uh, reduced admission prices, popularization in media, education, and so on and so on. And the area of assessments uh, uh, in a cultural democratization paradigm are sold ticket numbers, social consumption of the audience, and so on. On the other side, the cultural democracy created the measures through which support individual cultural expression, different kind of the subcultures, and the area of assessments uh, in this paradigm is a degree of participation and degree of individual expressions. Both paradigm uh, develop relations to equality, but the cultural democratization to equality of outcomes, results, and the products, while the cultural democracy uh, created uh, uh, relations to equality of opportunities. So, the concept of the cultural democracy, uh, unfortunately, the ideal of cultural democracy uh, is not fulfilled. And this is the reason why uh, many researchers, many cultural professionals criticize the concept of the cultural democracy as well, not only the democratization of culture. Uh, so this is the reason why it's really necessary to concern, to think about the main concerns of the cultural democracy in three areas. One of them is cultural policy, uh, where we have rhetoric limitations. So it means that uh, in a cultural policy framework, we can find a plenty of different documents and the paper uh, and different kind of the narratives uh, which articulated the issue of participation and the cultural democracy and how important it is. But but um, we, we, we face the lack of uh, concrete policy instruments through which this kind of the concept and the rhetoric can be transferred to the practice. So we basically uh, live in a time uh, of restricted, elitist, hierarchical, and centralized manner of cultural policy structures. And because of that, uh, we faced also the difficulties to change practices of cultural policy as well as the institutions as a consequence of these uh, changes. Another area which is necessary to think about is uh, arts and culture, of course. So cultural democracy in many cases criticized because of the cultural relativism. So the cultural relativism is referred to anti-hierarchical access to creativity, which basically means um, uh, approach to arts without respect uh, to arts as a hierarchical, vertical, selective process. The paradox of cultural development uh, uh, is uh, uh, this uh, creation of a regulation of artistic production um, on the free market, which is increased. On the other side, uh, uh, or parallel to this, uh, we have abolishment of elitist approach to uh, artistic production and the cultural production as well, and also the aim of increasing the number of the participants. And as a consequence of all of that, we have that the consumption and the accessibility at the end depends on the financial capacity, and uh, uh, while the, the level of uh, accountability de are decreasing. So this is also bring us uh, to the very important issue to take in to account when we discuss the cultural democracy is a, private, is a public quality and the ownership of culture because one of the main assumptions of the cultural democracy is uh, uh, understanding culture as a public good. But the question is how we can develop the cultural democracy in a context of the creative economy and privatization of the cultural fields uh, where the needs to generate the benefits are increase over the aesthetic uh, uh, aspects. And when uh, in a situation when aesthetic and the artistic values uh, are marginalized. The third area which is also necessarily to critically uh, 
understand or analyzed is, a, of course, participation. So basically, the crucial question here is who participate? Do we have uh, and created, the, organized the party only for the elites or not? Who decide? It's also another question. So the question is basically, does the gathering enough? What we have to do more to really create uh, engagement and the participation. So this is bring us to the question, who defines, uh, defines the rule of the game? Because it's not only the question of being a part of the game, then also to uh, create the rules of that games. So this imperative of forms uh, influence uh, and create the relativism of the content. And this is also something what is a very uh, necessary to critically understand or uh, uh, analyze when we talk about the participation. As well as inequalities, because participation uh, appear also with the idea of, you know, to work with these inequalities, but uh, since uh, uh, participation became mantra of neoliberalism uh, and focus, as I already said, most or dominantly on the formulation of the public opinion, but not to, uh, uh, to work on, the, on a real actual reform, uh, it's also can be understand as the notion who legitimize inequalities. So all of that basically blurred the lines between the participation, instrumentalization, and the populism, which is necessarily to be aware. So what kind of the participation legitimizes uh, uh, democratic cultural policy? So maybe you can try to move to another few slides more. Please go further. One more. So stay here, please. Thank you. Uh, so I suppose that many of you uh, know this, uh, uh, the ladder of citizens participation made by Einstein at the end of the 60s, but it still resonated. Why? Because it showed us the different uh, possibility of participation or different level, level of participation from non-participation to the higher level, which is, which is a citizen's power and the citizen's uh, control. So this is bring us to the topic, to the concept of of participatory governance. So what participatory governance does it mean? It's a sharing governance responsibility among different stakeholders, basically between the public and the city civil uh, sector, and empowers citizens for decision-making on a public issues. And uh, uh, it applies, uh, implies uh, many different aspects. Uh, solution, it's created solution for the erosion of democratic vitality, solution for political passivity, uh, citizens shift uh, from passive observers uh, to uh, being an active decision-maker. It's a created also more comprehensive and updated concept of the citizens' participation, uh, which is uh, related, of course, to the centralization of power structures and decision process, and the higher democratized model based on responsibility and common decision making. But all these kind of the decisions uh, should be related to uh, public problems and the public interest. What, talking about the participatory governance and talking about the creation of uh, a real participation or an environment which could offer us this possibility, I think that it's also important uh, to stress why it is important to support artistic autonomy within uh, the democratic cultural policy framework. I think that today we live in a, a context uh, uh, of democratic deficit and lack of democracy in institutions, domination of economic growth and efficiency, fails in contemporary public policy, withdrawal of state from intervention in the public services such as the social health, education, and so on, which basically uh, created the neoliberalization of the public policy. Um, we live in a, a society of inequality, 
uh, commodification of cultural resources, issues of accessibility is all around, rising nationalism, xenophobia, intolerance, and the discourse of participation perpetuates existing power relations in a case if uh, the decision-making process is not open. So all these changes places a plenty of demands for the cultural institutions and arts. So basically, if we live under the pressure as a cultural professionals, uh, uh, professionals and artists, and uh, uh, many expect that the arts should fulfill the all gap which we have in uh, in our context. And this is the reason why I think that always is necessary to remind ourselves uh, what intrinsic values in arts uh, are and why uh, they are important, which is resonates somehow to what Sergei yesterday talked about, the crisis of valorization and the uh, uh, dominant the domination of this instrumental benefits and instrumental uh, values. So intrinsic benefits are, are effects inherent in the arts experience itself. They are the starting point basically of any other benefits and values. Intrinsic benefits uh, are not str strictly private. It's uh, also contribute uh, to the public welfare. And what is uh, uh, really important to stress that intrinsic benefits are the principal reason why individual participate in the arts. So basically, without intrinsic value, we can't expect any other kind of the benefits. Intrinsic value could be uh, immediate, second, or third. It could be related to the private area or the public area. It uh, includes uh, pleasure, captivation, stimulation, meaning, growth of individual capacity, cognitive growth, creation of social bonds, expression of common values and the community, and so on. And it's really important important to have this in mind when we think about the cultural policy framework and how we can change and improve in a sense uh, uh, or in a context of democracy. So what should the 21st century democratic cultural policy looks like? If you uh, move to a few slides, a little bit more, just uh, I think it would be easier for you to follow my final thoughts. Uh, Next, does it work? Next, please. Next, okay. Um, so I think that uh, the, the, some aspect of the democratization of culture and cultural democracy should go hand in hand. But what democratic cultural policy for 21st century could bring us is uh, a culture for everyone in which all stakeholders, not only institutions, but also individuals and groups will be involved, open, uh, as I said earlier, decision-making uh, process, base the practices uh, on a participatory approach, different co-co-co-co-co, co-production, co co-creation, and so on. Uh, be similar for the professional and the amateur, and uh, make evaluation based uh, not only on uh, social quality, then also as aesthetic and artistic quality, and be ready for the transformation of the institution. Because uh, uh, today, especially when we talk and when we look uh, at the public cultural institutions, they are still maintenance and uh, uh, work uh, on on some elitist approach which established in the 19th century. So basically we faced uh, uh, and come into contact with the cultural products based on this uh, uh, elitist uh, taste and uh, desires. So based on this kind of the concept, uh, it's uh, possible to imagine a uh, transformation of the public institutions and I will uh, suggest you how, how it's uh, possible. So it's uh, necessarily to develop develop everything based on the sharing of responsibility and sharing of the resources, different kind of the resources, and based on the collaborative activities, of course, where the results would be uh, similar important as a process. Um, so 
all of that bring us to the idea of a, a new uh, public culture uh, because the participatory governance uh, could be uh, exist uh, in different models. It could be hybrid institutions, for example, creation of the new institutions established uh, by uh, uh, public and the civil sector, for example. It could be co-governance model. It could be joint management model. So different kind. But when we talk about the new public uh, uh, culture, uh, which is a concept coined by Croatian sociologist Vjeran Katunaric in 2004, somehow also resonate to the concept of the participatory governance because the idea of the new public culture is to bring together into a common space of dialogue, cultural production and expressiveness different cultural stakeholders which who have different kind of the interest and the motivation and also bring the heterogeneous public in the dialogue in this togetherness of working uh, on a, on some uh, some issues so the benefit of this uh, uh, new public culture concept could be on different level for stakeholders for example improvement of dialogue and level of cooperation rise uh, mutual trust increase governance capacity improve the ways of citizens' participation in decision-making process because it's not easy at all. It's a very complex, it's a, uh, uh, it's a, it's a really process. And also affiliated citizens as well as experts in a new institutional formats. For the society, what the benefits uh, could be uh, of this new public culture for the society? Invent and experiment with a range of new participatory mechanism, creation of the new values, new interactions, new relationships relations, new ways of engagement, uh, promotion of coexistence, civic progress, engagement, exchange, um, and also potentially uh, induce some positive changes and reshaping the society. And it could be also somehow tools for preserving public resources for the future generation. And in total, it could improve the social, economical, ecological aspects of the local environment. And the third area, which we can uh, also analyze the benefits uh, of the new public culture, is the cultural policy, of course. Especially for the testing new model of governance, rethinking the role and the mandate of the public institution in culture, distribute uh, public resources in a much more appropriate way, provide a wider access uh, to different groups and the individuals as well, and also create the uh, better condition for transparent realization of goals and achievement of results, which is a very uh, uh, important aspect uh, in this uh, context of uh, uh, deficit of uh, democracy, which happened all around the world. Uh, it also can increase the scope of care uh, for public needs and interests, because different stakeholders come together, sit on the same table, and discuss on the public uh, uh, interest, public uh, goods. At the end, of course, improved the democratic uh, uh, process and also created the long-term and sustainable places of encounter of different expressions and interests. So, in a total, uh, if we created the, this kind of the environment in in which different stakeholder can take a responsibility and became or uh, and take the role of being active decision maker, I think that uh, it's possible to create the new focal points, new meeting points, uh, new kind of the platform of knowledge um, that can't uh, um, address universality or claims universality, then be in a constant uh, reconsidering, renegotiation uh, its own position and be or create the dynamic platform which uh, always be ready for a change depends on the local context, but always also uh, take uh, uh, or defense the artistic uh, and uh, uh, artistic freedom and uh, uh, artistic expression. So 
I can't provide you any kind of the recipe how to do that. This is a different kind of the directions. But if it's necessary to bring something on the table, it should be a balance. Because I believe that uh, any kind of the radical policy is an uh, exclusionary policy as well. Thank you very much for your attention. So, I, I really hope that uh, uh, it, you were able to follow uh, this uh, lecture. Oh, I have one question there, or comments. Uh, so, if we have a time, can we get a mic? I see also there, and there, a lot of questions. Um, hi everyone, this is Madiha. Hello, um, thank you very much for the talk. It was very, very relevant to my work. I run a project called the Cultural Ecology Project in United Kingdom. This is more of a comment than a question. Um, first, well, I do have a question. Can we access your um, PowerPoint yes. uh, presentation somewhere? Yes. Because uh, there was a lot of information <laughs> that I can use in my practice and in my work for research. Um, also, um, the Cultural Ecology Project, just to add to what you said, um, um, I've met a lot of you here today, um, and I've told you about it already, but it's, um, I'm mainly based, I, I work in the South Asian art sector, and um, I do agree with you when you said, um, you know, the statement, um, participation, uh, cultural participation is a right, um, and I think um, we should all, as members of the arts community, uh, make sure that rather than creating work and inviting people to come and see it, uh, we need to create work with people um, and that will create a more sort of positive cultural ecology. Uh, that's all I wanted to say. But I would really like to access your um, PowerPoint presentation, please. Yeah, ITM Network already uh, has my PowerPoint okay. presentation, so I really hope uh, that uh, uh, they will be ready and happy to share with all of you. I don't have mine. Yeah, Thank I you. prepare for this uh, uh, occasion. Okay. So. Thank you, Dea, for sharing your uh, vision and also offering us an overview. I want to share with you my fear and also ask you to save us a bit. If you can, please do. Um, I think there is a systemic problem with democratic theories that value and focus on public, I think, a bit too much. Public spaces, public art, public culture. And um, what I think is that over the last couple of decades, but even before, um, what we have lost is actually this, the battle for the intimate. And today, the intimate is actually the space where the politics is decided, where voters decide, and so on. And if we look at the sphere of intimate, it is not, you know, theaters and schools and so on that are uh, reigning there, but actually Google and Facebook and other consumerist practices, but also in the intimate sphere, this is where the patriarchy and misogyny and all other forms of uh, exploitative um, um, ideologies are actually uh, ruling. So we have lost the battle for the intimate. My question is how can we as artists and as academics, as researchers, how can we regain some kind of access to the sphere of the intimate, to the lonely, to the bodily, to the corporeal, those that are not in the public? Because I think if we, um, whatever we do in the public sphere, it remains very far from the intimate spaces. And this is where capitalism has actually found a new way to, to, to rule. So do you have any idea what it would mean to regain some kind of a, a entrance to the intimate sphere? Thank you. Thank you, Goran, for your comments and uh, a really difficult question, uh, which uh, um, needs another 
half an hour at least uh, uh, to go deeper to this uh, uh, aspect. But I think that uh, as a public manipulated uh, intimate space as well is manipulated. And one of the possible answers could be also through arts, but understanding arts uh, through this intrinsic benefits which I mentioned earlier. Because arts uh, uh, doesn't happen only in the public space. It's happened in all of us, basically, you know, as uh, our expression and uh, uh, reaction to uh, the arts uh, uh, content, different kind of the content. So, but how we as a, uh, as a community, artistic and the cultural community can work on that, uh, I think uh, in, a, in a combination of different approach. And as I said at the end, I don't believe in any radicalization. I really believe on the balancing between different kind of the approach and the, and this kind of understanding of our environment and how we can imagine a better future, I utterly believe can bring us uh, to uh, you know, less polarization in our society in which we basically live, uh, in a society in a total, but as well in arts and culture, when we are uh, constantly in different kind of the fighting between the sectors, uh, uh, in the same disciplines, but as well between different actors, uh, and so on and so on. So this could be one of the possibility. Uh, I saw also there Um, yes, my name is Erum. Um, I have a question because when I, in the cultural policy documents in my country, we are very much emphasizing the sort of, um, the idea of participation, you know, the sort of where we are now. But what, and I see it very strongly and it's very strongly what the politicians are talking about and the field is talking about. But what I haven't really seen is that we are, making any large changes when it comes to how money is distributed. Large amounts of the money are still going to the big sort of traditional institutions. So are we seeing, are there any signs of, of, of money really being transferred? Uh, or any big changes in this anywhere? Yeah, I can... I'm example, basically. Uh, Croatia is example in that uh, uh, sense. How? Uh, I didn't basically introduce myself. I, I forgot. I don't care in many cases. I only said I'm not an artist, you know. But who am I, basically? I'm a manager. I'm a researcher. I used to be journalist as well. I work also as an editor. And somehow I'm a policymaker as well. Uh, I'm a director of Cultura Nova Foundation. Cultura Nova Foundation is a public institution established by the Repub government of the Republic of Croatia. Uh, after the long years advocacy process led by the civil society organization in contemporary arts and culture in Croatia, which uh, uh, 15 years ago came out with the idea of establishing a separate foundation dedicated to their purposes and interests. And after years of advocacy, in that period of time, our current Minister of Culture, Nina Obljan uh, Korzenek, uh, was a, a general secretary, or state secretary, what is the, the name in Croatia. And she recognized uh, the importance of uh, uh, creating of this uh, new arms lands bodies uh, in Croatia. Uh, so after a years, as I said, in 2011, the Republic of Croatia adopted the specific law on Cultura Nova Foundation. So what is our main purpose? To provide the grants, professional uh, and financial support to non-governmental, non-profit associations in contemporary arts and culture. So we are basically a ex Croatian example of the cultural democracy, how it's possible to create another uh, democratic mechanism for uh, providing financial support uh, to different actors in the cultural arena as well. 
but also is a question and uh, very much discussed in different contexts, in the UK especially, uh, where we have this arm's length principle uh, in the financing, uh, and, but still domination of experts as the one who decided about the uh, finance, financing and the support for the cultural actors. Uh, so some of the critiques uh, come also to this aspect in a sense of are you ready and are you able to open decision-making process and to create a much more participatory grant making. So involve the peers at least, so the people who basically work and be active in the cultural sector and who compete on some point uh, for the, the some amount of the money. And on the other side, uh, uh, open decision-making process as well for the citizens. So it could be, you know, some of the example uh, around us and possibility. So thank you. I, I, I got the sign to cut myself. <laughs> thank you for your attention one more. <laughs>